if I sang to them, ba ba da ba da ba da ba ba ba. If I said, could you sing to me the resting tone? They, first of all, I mean, or if I used a word other than resting tone, could you sing me home? No, they could not. Could you tell me what meter we're in? No. Could you show me where the big beats are, where the little beats are? We're as a, as a world, as a music education profession, uh, we're just not teaching our students to understand. We're teaching them to just imitate. You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast, and this is episode number 51. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in to the podcast for piano teachers. I'm Tim Topham, and today we have a fantastic guest with us, and I'm very excited to share his knowledge with you. His name is Andy Mullen, and he has uh, produced a blog post out on Monday this week, which I'd highly recommend you check out before you listen to this because it's actually going to put a whole lot of that stuff into context, although it's totally fine to watch this and then read his article as well. <laughs> um, Andy is an absolutely brilliant musician and teacher trainer. Uh, and he knows all about audiation and tonal and rhythm patterns and the music learning theory approach to teaching them. So I've really left the best to last this month. This is our last podcast in music learning theory month. I do hope you've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot and you're gonna learn even more today by seeing and hearing Andy in action. Like this guy almost sings everything, um, but he can't help but to make you really seriously rethink um, the way in which you might be teaching uh, your music students generally from the ground up. Like he's completely blown my mind and I can't wait for you to have a listen to what he does. He gets me singing, uh, we're reciting patterns to each other. It's a really great fun interview and I know you will enjoy it. Uh, remember to uh, last week I offered uh, for my 50th episode, very exciting, I offered $50 off membership of my uh, of an annual membership to my inner circle and I'm going to continue that on this week. If you're interested, then please take advantage of that. You can find out more by heading to timtopham.com slash community and if you're ready to take the plunge, dive in and really uh, innovate and expand and develop your teaching with a whole group of people around to support you, then use the code TTTV podcast, TTTV podcast, Tim Top TV podcast, in other words, TTTV podcast in the coupon code when you sign up. Uh, I've got a no obligation money back guarantee um, and you can pay either annually or monthly, but to get that offer, that's $50 off, you'll need the annual membership. I do hope uh, you consider joining us. Well, and also another reminder too that we're also offering transcripts from episode 50 onwards. So you'll be able to get the transcript and all the show notes as usual and be able to watch the videos at timtopham.com forward slash episode 51. Now, my guest today, Andy, oh, Andrew Mullen, he's a teacher, folk musician, multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, lifelong learner, and music learning theory teacher trainer. He has taught all levels of students in a number of subjects and is currently a middle school music teacher and curriculum coach in Burlington, Massachusetts. Andy holds master's degrees in music education and school administration, as well as certification from the Gordon Institute of Music Learning in elementary general music. So today's guest really knows music learning theory. He's been trained by the master and his institute, and he goes around teaching other student, uh, other teachers how to teach this. And the best part of this, and the reason I love doing these podcasts, is we actually, you can hear, you can see, and you can really interact with Andy. I'm also going to incorporate some of the videos that he mentioned and talked about in the blog post on Monday. So if you haven't read his blog post from Monday, totally fine, but I would encourage you to do that at some stage. I'm going to include some of the videos that he's created to help teachers just like you understand this concept of audiation um, better in uh, amongst the podcast discussion that we're about to have now. Uh, so I reckon we'll just get into it now. He will, I think, completely blow your mind. Here's Andy Mullen. All right, Andy, welcome to the call finally. Great to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to talk with you. I, I love all the stuff that you've done for the piano world and the music education world at large. So it's just 
just a real pleasure to talk with you. Brilliant. Well, look, and uh, if for those of you who are listening and not watching, uh, you'll notice that Andy sounds incredibly professional. It's, 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 I think this is one of my the most professional interviewees I've had on here. Uh, but you'll find out why a bit later on when we discuss some of the videos that he's put together for you guys. So let's first talk about um, how you personally got into music learning theory because you're not only teaching it to your students, you're actually, I think you're a presenter, is that right? Or you've certainly had study from the Gordon Institute. Uh, that's uh, a lot of that is right. Uh, about five years ago, I, I took an online course with uh, noted choral pedagogue James Jordan, and I don't know if you've you've heard of him, but uh, he's a, he's a pretty pretty crackerjack teacher, and and he uses music learning theory as probably one of the main foundations of 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 his whole practice. And so, after reading a lot of his materials, he kept making reference to this Edwin Gordon guy and to this this monster book, uh, Learning Sequences in Music by uh, by Doctor Gordon. It's a big one. Oh my goodness, and- that is thick. I didn't realize it was that fat. <laughs> I've yeah, been told it's, uh, it's pretty heavy reading. It's uh, heavy reading, literally and figuratively. <laughs> uh, so I thought I would go right to the source, and and I bought the book, and I made it about two chapters in, and just didn't understand any of it. So, <laughs> uh, so I bought these lecture CDs, which I would highly recommend to. To anybody, they're uh, they're sold by GAA, which is the publication that uh, the publishing company that publishes all of Dr. Gordon's work. And there's a half hour lecture that's associated with each chapter, and it just everything really, really hit home. Listening to Dr. Gordon speak is a lot easier than uh, than actually reading him. So I would recommend that to anybody who's interested in music learning theory. There's some lectures that are available actually for free on the Gordon Institute of Music Learning Theory. Uh, University of South Carolina website. We can link to that later on. Mm. But that's really how I got started. I have a, about a half hour, 45 minute commute. So spent a lot of time in the car just listening to the old guy talk and it just really, really hit home. And he was just, he just said all the problems that I was having in music education and he has answers. Mm. He has answers to many of those questions and many of those problems that we have. So, you know, just listening and listening and listening and then more books and and listening again. And it's MLT, music learning theory, is like, you know, peeling back an onion. There's just the layers just never, ever, ever, ever stop. So it's been a really exciting journey for me. And I'm happy to be now presenting all that stuff that I've learned to the to the world at large. Fantastic. And so what kind of teaching do you do today, these days? Uh, currently, I teach middle school general music. I have uh, sixth and seventh graders. Is that what you call it there? Year yep. six? And- yep. So about 12, 13 year olds? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Early, early teenagers. And I do, uh, I teach keyboard to sixth graders and guitar to seventh graders, you know, as well as just general musicianship. And I have two choruses, a, a big chorus and a, a more select chorus. And I do a little fiddle, a little banjo, and I have a rock band at the, at the school. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to implement MLT in, in a lot in a number of different areas. And the great thing is that the, uh, the concepts work for, for small groups, for individual, for classroom, so even though we're, we're talking to you, you're a classroom specialist effectively, I guess, in the middle years, um, all of the stuff that we're talking about can apply to any instrumental lesson, right? Yeah, there's there's Gordon certifications in, uh, there's one for early childhood, there's a whole mess of early childhood uh, materials and resources and certifications. There's elementary general, which is the level that I just took uh, last week. Uh, there's an instrumental one, as as you know, you talked with Marilyn Lowe. There's a piano one, so it's it's yeah. It, yeah. As you say, it applies to individual students and uh, and groups as well. Great. Well, look, we've had a lot of posts this week and some podcasts as well about music learning theory. And a lot of the talk is regarding this concept of audiation, which is a term that Dr. Gordon actually coined, I believe. And it's really, really crucial. But I think without seeing it in action, it's quite hard to understand. So I'm really excited to have you on to talk specifically about audiation, but to also share with my viewers some of your videos, 
which are just brilliant in actually getting a feel for these. So what I'm going to do now is just jump in. We're going to listen to part of one of Andy's audiation station videos, and you can talk a little bit more about it afterwards. But would you recommend um, the teachers who are listening to this for the first time or watching it, uh, what, what should they do as they're listening or watching? Ooh, I think they should start at the beginning. Yep. That's that's what I think that they should do. They should start at the beginning. Gordon is fond of, of saying things like there's no correct chronological age. There's a musical age. So you never really know what your musical age is until you start back at the beginning. Cool. All right. Well, let's have a quick listen to uh, one of Andy's first videos. Lesson one. Sing the first pitch of the tonal pattern you hear. After each tonal pattern, there will be a brief pause. During the pause, audiate the first pitch. When you hear me take a breath, it's very important that you breathe with me and then sing the first pitch. Use the neutral syllable, bum. Let's practice. Here's your pattern. Bum, bum. Pause, audiate, sing the first pitch. Bum. Let's try another one. Bum, bum. Bum. Bum, bum. Bum. Bum, bum. Bum. Now try them on your own. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. Great. All right. So, Andy, tell us a little bit about what we've just heard and, and how we can actually use this in, in my audience as, as piano teachers, how we can apply it to the teaching that we're doing without having to go through all the process of having all the training. Are there things that we can do tomorrow with our students? Absolutely. Uh, music learning theory teaches with what what is called a whole part whole philosophy w h o l e part traditional spelling and then whole w h o l e the whole the first whole is the context that we're in so the context being a tonality or a meter the parts of it are what uh, we refer to in mlt is tonal patterns and rhythm patterns. And then once we've listened to the whole, dissected it for parts, tonal patterns and rhythm patterns, which are the words of music, then the whole begins to make a lot more sense. We, we understand the context of the content. For example, if we... If we just have bum, bum... That's just a tonal pattern that's out out there in the world. Bum, bum. But there's no context to it. We can take bum, bum, and we can give it this context. Now that has more context, but say we, we give it a different context. Well, now that has a different context. Now we're in minor tonality. We could be in Phrygian tonality. You never know. We could be in Dorian tonality, but we're getting we're getting let's stick with we're minor. getting a lot close. Yeah, all right, fine. Let's we'll stick with minor. <laughs> but I think too often as teachers, we give our students a lot of context without context, uh, and they just really they just become imitators. Do you mean and content think, without context? What did you mean to say? Context without context. I meant to say the right one, which is the way I think you said. Uh, we content. Give, we, give our, we give content without context. context. Without context, yes. Yeah. And and they become they become imitators, and they don't become audiators. And they need you need audiation in order to to say something musically. And so, and part of this is is about the fact that if they are given that context of let's say the major tonality. We want students to be able to go bum, bum, bum. Sorry, it's like 6 a.m. here. Bum, <laughs> bum, 
Bam, we want them to be able to hear that resting tone. The tonality of the key, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we're cons- and music learning theory and, and the practical application of music learning theory, we're constantly asking students to provide that resting tone. We always want our students to be able to provide the resting tone because without the resting tone, we don't have good intonation. We're constantly comparing whatever it is what we're doing to the resting tone. Now, that doesn't really make too much of a difference in piano because, you know, everything is everything is tuned. But for most other instruments, uh, violin and horns, you know, you really, really need to have a good sense of intonation. Mm. And so what the Audiation Station videos do is, and what we just heard, is it's the parts. It, it takes students through just some very, very, very basic parts. Uh, in Audiation Station, I, I plan to take students through major and minor tonalities, duple and triple meters, and teach everybody, teach students the one chord and the wide and the five chord in both tonalities, and for students to be able to understand big beats, little beats, divisions, and the space in between. So that's my goal. And so what we just heard was effectively just one little snippet of parts that students should be able to take and practice and eventually reproduce and eventually, eventually hopefully not too eventually, improvise with. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do for our students is to teach them how to uh, to improvise. Mm. So if I was a 13-year-old coming into your music class, what would the first five minutes be all about? This means audiate. Don't do anything, just audiate. Listen to my song. Move like me. Now you can't see my feet, but I'm... Mm. Yum bum bum, move like me. Ba da 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 dum bum 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 ba da 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 da. Then move like me. Little beats on the lap like this. Ba da dum ba dum bum 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 bum. I'm doing the the quick version for you. Yeah, yeah. Then put them together. So you're, tapping, you're tapping the feet? Is that what uh, you're doing that we can't see? That's right. Yeah. Sh- shall I move my No, computer? no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so big beats are in the feet, little beats are in the lap with what we call spider fingers. Then we try to put them together. Move like me, um, bum, bum, together now, bum, ba, dum, ba, dum, bum, et cetera. And all this time they're just listening and they're, they're just, this them, is, no vocalizing. This is, not yet. No, this is the the whole part, whole philosophy. They're getting the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, lots of times. But at the same sense, we're comparing the whole against the parts. What are the parts? Big beats. Which we'd call crotchets, I guess, right? Or uh, whole notes. Whole notes? No. Oh, no, no. That's no. A quarter, bad, quarter whole note. notes is a bad, bad word in music learning theory is terms. We Why is that? Yeah. Because that's what uh, what we would call in the business uh, theoretical understanding. We 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 want to start with labels that are kind of devoid of theory. So big beats and little beats together. Mm, mm, mm. So we've isolated a couple of rhythmic elements. We still have the big hole. Then we we talk about flow. We don't talk about flow. We do flow. Flow is very very important because flow is the space in between the beats. So we do it again. Yum, bum, bum. Listen to my song. And we do little flow. Bum, 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 bum. As much as they'll do, sometimes they're a little leery about flowing way too much. <laughs> so those are some uh, rhythmic elements Then we do. Then we do some tonal elements. See, yum, bum, bum. Listen to my song. And whenever I stop, I want you to sing. Bum. Ba da 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 dum bum bum. 
bum, they all say bum. We haven't labeled it anything because we're still in what's called aural aural, in through the ears, out through the mouth, and back in. Bum, bum, bum. Bum. Which is a little bit challenging because it's, it's, it's a five chord function and they have to kind of go back to one bum. Yeah. And then we do a ba da 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 dum bum bum bum. Let it linger. <gasps> bum. Good. Uh, oh, very nice. How, how did I go? Did I go well? <laughs> <laughs> it was a great bum. Great bum. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> and then we say something like, now you've heard that song about 1,700 times. Could you please audiate the song? Can you please raise your hand when you are done audiating the song? Yum, bum, bum. Audiate. And then they'll raise their hand when they're done. And then now uh, you've heard me sing this song about 1,700 times. I bet you'd like to sing this song. Yay! Yum, bum, bum. Ready, sing. Da, 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 da. <laughs> then the one kid with a changed voice. Ba, da, 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 da. <laughs> and then they sing. And then we, we do something like, and I have this uh, kind of all dialed up here, ready to go. I, I, I would love for you to sing it and then for me to sing something else, but I don't think that it would jive in the space-time continuum. Probably we could try. Right? Do you want to try it? All right, let's try it. So you sing this song, and I'm going to sing a different song. I'm going to call it my song. Yum, bum, bum. Ready, sing. Ba, 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 well, it's going to be fascinating to listen back to, or really <laughs> awful. <laughs> so, effectively, you're singing the melody, and I'm singing the bass line. I'm I'm providing the harmony for them. Yeah. And then I divide the class in half, and one half would sing the melody, then the other half would sing the the chord roots, the harmonic functions. And then we would switch, and they would have the very first really true musical experience with melody and rhythm and harmony all together. Now, I talked a lot. In, in reality, that would take about, you know, three, depending upon the length of the song, three, four, five minutes. And it's a really, really great introduction to music learning theory. And that's really what I was trying to provide in the Atune videos is listening opportunities uh, for individuals to be able to listen and pick out melody and pick out rhythm and pick out harmony and have those kinds of musical experiences. It's such a great overview. I really, really love that you've gone and demonstrated this for us because it really puts it into perspective. You can read all you want about audiation, but to actually hear someone who knows what they're doing actually do it, uh, I think it's brilliant. So I actually reckon we might um, have a listen to one of your e-tunes uh, right now. Um, so this is, this is a chance for all the teachers uh, watching to actually – participate in exactly the activity you've just described, right? Absolutely. And there's a video that's at the beginning of the playlist, which uh, kind of gives you directions and, and challenges you and charges you with, with what you should be doing with these Etude, video, Etude videos. Okay. So to, to save us worrying about that now, can you give them a quick overview of what they should be doing when we're about to listen to this one now? We won't play the whole thing, but just a little bit of it. Well, you just heard it. You should basically go through rote song procedure with these videos. So listen to the videos, see if you can move your feet to the big beat. Move your hands to the little beat. Can you do both together? Can you move with flow as you're listening to them? Can you sing the resting tone as you're listening to it? Can you constantly hear the resting tone? Can you sing the melody? There's spaces in the video where the melody drops out. You've heard it about, you know, by the time the melody drops out, you probably have heard it six or seven or eight times. Can you can you sing the melody without without the support of having it of having it actually, you know, in physical space? Can you listen to the bass line and can you when the bass drops out, can you sing the bass line by yourself? So it's really kind of a, an interactive musical experience. I also like that the, the instruments built up as well over time. So you would start with just, I think it's a piano, is it? And then Sometimes we, it's a piano, yeah. Yeah, and then we add more and more instruments. But I'm as interested 
Uh, actually, no, we're going to come back to that. Let's have a listen now to your um, one of your e-tunes. Which one would you recommend? The just because the, they're all in the different uh, key uh, modes, aren't they? Yeah, I would start with major and minor. Those are right. our, that's where we start with in, in music learning theory. So maybe start with major. Great. So let's have a listen to the major e-tune uh, from Andy right now. I really love um, coming back to what you were talking about with regard to how you approach your classes, is that you're using your voice. It sounds like you're using your voice almost the whole time. You haven't played an instrument. You're not playing that thing. You're actually singing it. Is there an important? Is that an important thing? Or could you just as well play it on a violin? I think uh, most music learning theory teachers use their voice as their primary instrument. Now, I, I mean, I'm a, I play piano, I play guitar, I play fiddle, I play banjo, and I do often use the these kinds of instruments because they do provide harmonic stability, uh, which I think is is important. But uh, as much as I possibly can, I like to use my voice and you know the voice is is the delivery of of the patterns as well which we haven't talked about in relation to uh to the part whole part whole the 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 patterns being part of uh, our audiation vocabulary we use we use our voice for that for example if audiate the pattern i sing wait for the gesture take a breath and be my echo would tim would you be my echo yes <laughs> thank you very much <clears throat> I'm establishing tonality. This can't be anything else but major tonality. If we are in minor tonality, can't be anything else but minor tonality. Back to major. Be my echo. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Very good. Could you take a breath before you go? Bum, bum. Me first. Bum bum. 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 Bum bum bum. Bum 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 bum. I think I botched that one. Bum bum bum. Bum 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 bum. And then that's oral, oral. Then the next thing we would do is we would use solfege to label it. Sol, la, sol, fa, mi, re, ti, do. We're in the tonality of major because do has the resting tone. Please sing do. 
Do. What's the tonality? Do. Major tonality. Major. <laughs> <laughs> then we would apply those the syllables to those same patterns that we did. Do mi do. Do mi do. Re ti re. Re ti re. So mi do. So mi do. Very nice. Any combination of do mi so is what we call in the business a music Major. learning theory. Oh, what was it? Was I going to get it wrong? <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say a major triad. <clears throat> yes, it, 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 with music theory, music theory, not to be confused with music learning theory, but with music theory, music learning theory, we label that. Uh, purists would label that tonic. Tonic. Mm. I, in my own practice, and with 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 apologies to Dr. Gordon, who's watching over us all. We call him uh, the MLT police, but he's no longer with us. So, you know, his, his power is uh, useless here. Uh, I, in my own practice, I call it a one chord pattern. It, for me, tonic is not the best label. Now, MLT purists would argue that you don't want to use one because it means numbers mean something else to students. I understand that. But I feel it's inappropriate if we're already going tonic, dominant tonic. We're already kind of teaching them two labels, so I'm just going to cut right to the chase and just use, call it a one chord pattern or for short, one. So anyway, back to my explanation. Any combination of do, mi, so is called a one chord pattern. If I sing a combination of do, mi, so, say one. If I sing anything other than um, a one chord pattern, say no. Let's practice. Okay. Do, do, mi, so. Do. One. One, sorry. So far, re, ti. No, no, and we would go on, and we would then we would label any combination of so fa re ti is called a five chord pattern. If I sing a five chord pattern, say five. If I sing anything else, you say no. So we're teaching students to label and to really get the sounds of do mi so so fa re ti in their ears, so that when we get to that first song that we're going to play on the keyboard, and for me, it's Mary had a little ham. Did, I can't do Mary. Did you say ham? I can't. That, yeah, that's right. Uh, I can't do Mary Had a Little Lamb in middle school, so I, I talk about this selfish little girl named Mary who wouldn't give me any of her ham. Uh, so I sing, Mary had a little ham, little ham, little ham. Mary had a little lamb and wouldn't give me none. Pardon the double negatives. <laughs> so when when we get to that song, I want them to have that sound. I want them to have that in their ears. I want them to have that that sense of harmony in their ears. I think that's one of the main problems with music education today is melody, 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 no context. And we totally forget about harmony until they get to what? College? If that. I mean, it, it, if that. I think we need to have a, a, a blend in music education of melody, rhythm, and harmony. You know, it's, 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 it's the three-thirds of music and Harmony is really traditionally largely being ignored. I'm, I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry. You, I'm on tangent upon tangent upon tangent. It's uh, it's what I've got you on here to do, right? This is okay. this is what I, I want. I want to get as much from you as I can in a short amount of time. Um, I'm I'm really interested. How do your teenagers take a, a lesson like this, or do they just know nothing else? Because I would imagine other teachers who might have been teaching in a different way and might look at this and go. You know, that sounds really good. It makes so much sense. But my teenagers would look at me like I'm a complete idiot if I started just getting them to swing their arms around and, and all that. Am I off? Am I, have I got it completely wrong? No, no, you're, you're, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that it's really all in your delivery. Now, my students, they're just, they're just used to me singing directions. And, you know, we have like little roasts before my for all of our concerts and they all just start talking all of their, they're just used to it. You know, they, they're, they're just used to this language. They're just used to, you know, one five, they're used to bum, you know, they're just, they're just used to this language. And as, and as a matter of fact, in my district, we're going quote unquote, all MLT next year, the district kind of hired me as an in-house professional development specialist, a curriculum coach. And we're implementing this, 
K-12s. And really? I think that that's, that's a huge. very, it, it is huge. It's a very, very exciting time for me and for many teachers in the district. Uh, maybe, maybe not all of them, but uh, I think it's going to be fantastic that when students come to be in sixth grade, they can already, they already have a, a basic working musicianship and they understand already when they come to me what a, what a one and a five is. And they're already audiating what the difference between major and minor is. And, I really, I, dang it, I shouldn't have to do this in the middle school and I shouldn't have to uh, teach them what a resting tone is. You know, I think this really should be a part of every music student's vocabulary. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, currently uh, my students, when they come in to be in sixth grade, most of them cannot audiate. I mean, they all audiate to, they don't have the labels. They, they can audiate, everybody audiates to a specific degree. But for the most part, most students in this in this country and maybe the world just are not audiators. As I said, they're they're imitators, and that's that's what the GIML Gimmel, the Gordon Institute of Music Learning Theory, is trying to do. Is trying to to teach students in this way. Well, what do you mean by imitating? Uh, singing back what they hear on the radio, sort of thing, but not understanding it from a tonal perspective. Yes, imitation without understanding. If I sang to them, ba ba da ba da ba da ba ba ba, if I said, "Could you sing to me the resting tone?" They, first of all, I mean, or if I used a word other than resting tone, could you sing me home? No, they could not. Could you tell me what meter we're in? No. Could you show me where the big beats are, where the little beats are? They, uh, we're as a, uh, as a world, as a music education profession, uh, we're just not teaching our students. To understand, we're teaching them to just imitate. And really, the the, the truly sad thing about imitation, and this is uh, this is this is like directly out of Gordon's mouth, is is if you gave a concert and the next day asked all of your students in solo to sing the song from the concert, the majority of them would likely not even be able to sing back by themselves. That everybody is just constantly imitating each other, and that's why we have individual class patterns in music learning theory. A, a pattern isn't a student's property until they can sing it back to you in solo. Then it becomes their property. <laughs> uh, I think this is all just such a fascinating approach, and it makes just so much sense. As everyone who has responded to any of the posts that we've put out in this month have said, oh, this just makes so much sense. Um, so it's it's fantastic to hear that the music district has actually gone, you know what, I think this is important, which is which is great. And it's great that you've got music in your primary schools. I mean, over here, it, it's music's really at the primary school level. It's at it's the elementary level. It's becoming a little bit rare. Kids don't learn because of the Christmas carols or folk songs anymore at class they don't sing national anthems very often it's pretty yeah it's pretty sad so they don't take music the same way they would take uh, art class physical education class they they don't it, it depends on the school uh, as far as i believe uh, look i would like to think that most of them do have something but it wouldn't be that corporate comprehensive or that often if 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 at all but the the amount of time that's being delivered devoted to it is definitely reducing and it has that's, an impact. Oh, that's a shame, and mm. and uh, it just speaks to to how society at large feels about music education. You know, they feel as if it's just uh, you know a time for for teachers to classroom teachers to to grade papers, and you just you need something for them to do. So they might as well do art. They might as well do music. But and 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 they feel that way because they themselves were probably given less than adequate music education they weren't taught to audiate so the, the cycle just continues and continues and and uh and that's what i'm trying to do as, as best as i can and uh, in my youtube way to get uh, to get audiation out there we're going to share lots of links to all your um videos as you have done in the blog post this week so thank you very much for sharing that i wanted to ask you about could i um and its use in music learning theory and the importance of it. Because I know that when you start with these tonal patterns, the instruction 
from Dr. Gordon, I believe, is to use neutral syllables, ba, da, bum, and things like that, which is what we've been doing today. But then you take it another step and you start adding sulfur or sulfage. Why is that important? Well, uh, can I just address the beginning of your question? You asked about Kodai. Uh, I don't. I, I guess I wasn't following how how Kodai fits into your question. Oh, okay. So, well, my understanding is that the the solfege concept was a Kodai construct. Oh, I mean, it goes back even farther than Kodai. I mean, Kodai oh, just happened to use this technique. Yeah, I mean, solfege syllables go back to you know. Guido in the uh, I think the 15th century, if I'm getting my my music history correct, uh, but this constant. But okay, now that we have that cleared up, to, to answer your question, uh, this this concept of using solfege, it's it's a technique. It's a uh, it's technique, and and you know, when we begin, we use what what is called aural aural neutral syllable, bum 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 bum. Bum bum, and in rhythm we use ba 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 ba. And the reason we use those syllables is because Gordon always says that the sound itself is fundamental. Bum bum is it. That's the the sound is the thing first. And the reason that we use these syllables is because. If we start to have too many patterns, students don't have a way to organize them and generalize them. So we use in 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 rhythm, we use this uh, beat function syllable that's all based on do, so that students can have it an organizational taxonomy in their brain of the system. So the way that the system works uh, in rhythm is all macro beats are do do do. Do. So the big beats are always do, 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 do. If we take the big beat, we can either divide it into two or three. If we have, if we're in duple, we use do, day, do, day, do, day, do, day, do, day, do, day. If we're in triple, we use do, dotty. Big beat is still do, do, do. Then do, dotty, do, do, de, do. Hum, de, dum, de, sat on a wall. Do, de, do. Dee do da dee do, and I, I don't know how much further you want me to delve into this syllable system. Ch- shall I go one more layer? One more. Uh, we use the syllable ta to indicate that there we're going to further divide the beat. So do day do day do day add a ta do to day ta to day to do to day do do ta 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 to do to day do or for in triple do da di do to di do to da to di to do do ta ta to do da di do to da to di to do so we're teaching them rhythmic function now so you could take do da di do do da di do is that three four or six eight who the heck knows because it's the same sound if you audiate silent night ba 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 you know put a gun to your head is it written in three four or six eight i i don't know so why should the syllable system be any different do to d do do to d do so it's quote unquote in rhythmic, the same way we uh, same word would be in harmonic, no mm-hmm. C flat and B. Well, this is in rhythmic. You could you could write that same rhythm pattern in six eight or three four, and the ending sound would be exactly the same. I remember Marilyn talking about that, and that's the, that the reason that the the you use the enharmonic structures is for that reason, and it's something that confounds students all the time, doesn't it? that something that looks this way can sound different or vice versa. Yeah, and then, you know, it's music notation has its limitations. And I think that if we follow the skill learning sequence that Gordon provides for us, if we start with the ear first, have an oral organization taxonomy of these rhythm patterns and tonal patterns, then when we get to reading, it's just, oh, I know what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. It could look like this. It could look like that. But if it's always 
already in your audiation, making that that transfer to reading is is just it's just a lot easier, a lot easier. So the answer, I guess, to the question reusing the solfege is to give them a way to to you called it a taxonomy, you know, a way to describe what's going on musically. Yeah, an organizational system. If mm. they hear bum bum bum, they can if if they're taught to that that's do me so oh that's a one chord pattern. So you hear the so you hear a walking bass go a boom ba boom 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 boom. Ooh, I hear that. That's a that's a one chord pattern or a tonic pattern. Boom 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 boom. I already know what that sounds like. I, I know how to play that on the piano. And then you hear a bum, 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 bum. Oh, that's a four chord pattern. Yeah, I didn't know what it sounds like. It's just, it's just a beautiful system. Yeah, it's fantastic. How long did it take you to learn all of this? Let's see, 45 minutes a day in the car times home and back. No, just kidding. Uh, it's, it's dense. It's dense, man. But I think that it's not as dense as... It's not as dense as as this. It <laughs> doesn't need to be this complicated. Uh, and he's holding and up uh, Dr. Gordon's <laughs> original book, which is <laughs> half the size of the Bible and double the <laughs> physical size this way. <laughs> uh, I think that one thing that uh, that music learning theory practitioners and and Dr. Gordon himself did not do very well is to disseminate the information in bite-sized ways, step by step, so that so that people or persons, as Dr. Gordon would say, so that persons could grasp it. And that's really what I'm trying to do with my audio station 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 videos and my YouTube channel is to get this information out there in a in an accessible way uh, so that people can begin to audiate. And it's it's not as hard as as that book is making it out to be. I mean it's it's dense and there's there's a lot to think about, but I think to do the bare minimum is not that hard. Is that a good way to put it? To do the bare minimum to teach your students. I mean if you took in everything that I said today in 44 minutes and 37 seconds, I mean that's a that's a it's a good starting point. You know, you've you've got a lot to just to to get you started, you know, to to teach students lots of holes, W H O L E that is tonalities and meters. You got to learn them yourself. That makes you a better musician to learn them. So spend a little time with these uh, audiations or these uh, these atunes. Learn some tonalities. Learn some learn some new rhythms. Uh, learn some tonal patterns. Learn what they mean. And you know, challenge yourself. Just start at the very very beginning. I I, I think that it's doable. It, it's doable. Fantastic. Uh, and with your videos, I think absolutely it's it's doable. So my my suggestion to everyone watching is to go and actually listen to your videos or watch them and just have them playing. I was having them playing while I was preparing questions and things for, for podcasts. And as you say, they repeat so many times, you just, you start humming them almost without trying. Uh, and which might not be the, the, the point of course, because you're trying to get people to concentrate, but you know, you do pick these things up and you can get a pretty good idea of the concepts that you're trying to teach through just absorbing that way. Absolutely. I mean, to me, Phrygian is no big deal anymore. I mean, it's it, it, it's just it's just part of my audio vocabulary right now. And and you know, I, ever, I just had a, a very distorted view of what the modes actually were. I thought that they were just really abstract scales that you know people who really really knew what they were doing uh, in the jazz world they would oh I'm, I'm playing in with Phrygian it just did not make any sense to me until I started studying this material and realized that Phrygian yes it could be a scale that you use but these modes are tonal centers you know there are there are songs that are in Phrygian there are songs that are in Lydian uh and they're they're beautiful. And gosh, if we could if we could get musicians to start playing songs and and learning songs and writing songs in Phrygian and Locrian, uh, I mean, there are a lot of songs that are in Dorian. Many many songs that are in Dorian. A lot of reggae songs are in Dorian. A lot of folk songs are in Dorian. But do the 
the musicians who are playing them know that they are in Dorian as opposed to they just have a minor chord, so it just must be in minor. Nay, 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 nay. No, no. There's a big difference between Dorian and minor. Shall I one to it? Yes. For your listeners? Yes, very quickly. All right. <laughs> Same basic pattern, but with Dorian. <laughs> Got that beautiful uplift, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. Da, 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 that, that major, major six. Bit. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, this is brilliant. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether you had any examples of a breakthrough or a big advantage that you've seen in your students that this pro process has has created. You know, suddenly your student could just play this thing that they couldn't before, or you had they put together a fantastic band, or I'm not sure. Have you got anything that you can think of? Oh, it just happens all the time. You know, it just happens all the time. You know, uh, in my in my chorus, my I would love to play you some A Bs of. Uh, of my chorus, once they understood the concept of resting tone, their intonation has just improved, like leaps and bounds, just a tremendous, tremendous. So anybody who's a, who's a chorus teacher, I would strongly recommend, you know, wrapping your head around this because once you teach these concepts to your chorus, it's pretty incredible the way that the intonation gels. Once you start teaching flow, I know it seems a little odd to, to get your kids to do this, but once you start teaching flow, you have far fewer problems with tempos just taking off. Why? Because they understand the space in between the big beats. Brilliant. Uh, I, I think we're going to stop there because, you know, it's just been brilliant. And uh, I was going to, yeah, I've got a few more questions for you, but I think with we, when we add the videos in, this will be over an hour already. So I think that's, that's a great amount of time. Maybe we'll even chop it up into two podcasts or something because the I'd prefer to actually share more of those videos perhaps um, than than less. So anyway, we'll uh, I'll have a bit of a think about that. But look, people are going to want to know where to find out more about what you're doing. So where, where should they go to find out about you and what you're working on? Well, I have a humble little website called uh, theimprovingmusician.com and uh, it's a little bit of an upstart website. There's not that much stuff, but all of my YouTube content is on there. I, if you know of a good web designer, let me know because it, it it needs a needs a little a bit makeover. of a facelift. <laughs> oh, yeah, it needs a makeover for sure. But you got to start somewhere, uh, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's great that absolutely. you're getting yeah. Look, and uh, can I thoroughly encourage people to go and watch and listen to your videos? The quality of them is outstanding. It, it looks like you're an absolute professional. Uh, well, you are a professional, but a professional voiceover person or something like they sound so clear and they're so easy to understand. Um, so thank you so much for putting that out there. I was also going to ask whether you actually have put together a method of some sort or books or anything to support the work that you do. Uh, well, I have a quote unquote method book that I use with, uh, with my sixth graders, but it, it has not been made available for, for publication. Maybe I should, maybe this is, I, I, I could put something together like that, but, uh, uh, so I guess the quick answer is, no. Is yes, 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 but no. Yes, yes, I've made one. It's just, you know, a collection of PDFs and takes my students through uh, what I want them to know at, at, at the keyboard. I want to show your readers, your your viewers, one other thing. This is a plug for uh, for a program called Little Kids Rock. Have you talked to anybody about Little Kids Rock? It's just an amazing program. And they have these things that are called jam cards. Get in on this, Tim. Yeah. These, these things are fantastic. This is what a what a jam card looks like. Uh, it's a little cards, and you. And this is a wonderful technique that I use for my students. Once they've learned what a one chord is and a five chord is, well, this card gives them a visual representation of a one chord and a five chord. Let me pop it on here. See if you can. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Did it fall over? Yep. So right, right now we're in. Efto, and it's just a really, really 
a really, really easy, quick way for them to just put their fingers in the right place without explaining it. Yeah. And then and then you just move it over, and all of a sudden, you're in Jito, and you move it over again, you're in Edo. It's it's a pretty remarkable thing. Groovy. So I yeah. so I use this as part of my curriculum, which is I guess why I haven't really published it because you know I'm using Other somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where do people find those or find out more about them? Uh, that's, Maybe you can send me a link. That's at littlekidsrock.org. Yeah, I right. believe you can cool. you can print them out. Great. And there was a, a link that you mentioned right at the start. We must try and remember what that is and, and pop a link to that in the show notes. I'll, I'll get back to you on it. Very good. Brilliant. Andy, thank you so much. And it was really great fun talking to you. I'm inspired. I'm going to do some oh. do daddy does. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very good. It's uh, been a pleasure talking with you as well. (laughs) Thanks so much. We'll speak to you again soon. Very good. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.